Recipes for Technical Trading Success in Cook's Kitchen. So what can we learn from Bernie Madoff? You know, I've, uh, I'm not highlighting his death for any particular reason, but it is a good time to review what the man wrought and what we can still learn. And this is of particular interest to me because I was writing about this before we ever heard his name. In, uh, in the early 2000s, I was doing research on rogue traders, you know, rogue traders at banks. Uh, you know, we had Nick Leeson who took down Barings Bank in 1995. And then even right before Bernie Madoff, we, we heard, we learned of him in, um, uh, in December of 2008, Jerome Kerviel blew up, uh, I think it was Sock Gen. Well, well, we'll look in a second, but he was hiding some trades and lost that bank about $5 billion. Um, and then, and then Bernie came along and, and trounced everybody <laughs> by, you know, taking, taking uh, millions and billions here and there from unsuspecting investors. So let's take a look at some of the research I was doing even before Madoff made off with their money. All right, so um, on my Medium blog, I, I sort of put this together, um, an original article I published in a magazine called SFO, stood for Stocks, Futures, and Options. The magazine no longer exists, so I sort of reproduced my article uh, from July 2008. Um, and it was titled Mental Models of Financial S Sabotage because I had been uh, I had been a interbank currency trader for 10 years. Um, I was also on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So I got to see a lot of stuff and, and I s got to see a lot of great traders. But more than that, I got to see a lot of failure, too. And so I became passionately interested in that. Well, what were the dynamics of success? Why the few succeeded? And what were the, the, the common traits of the majority, say 95% of new traders who failed? And it, so it pulled me into neuroscience, studying the brain, and also behavioral finance. So, uh, you know, Daniel Kahneman and uh, his early experiments on how irrational people can be when it comes to money, risk, and uncertainty. And my thesis by uh, 2008 was that your brain wasn't made to trade. Uh, you know, I kind of made that a, a a clever rhyme. Your brain wasn't made to trade, but I really had a point about evolutionary psychology, how, what our brains evolved for, and what what our brains were good at. Uh, and and one of the things that seemed to challenge our brains and uh, and find out where we weren't very skilled is short-term trading, you know, when you're staring at a screen of flashing green and red lights um, and, all, you know, all the emotions that get triggered and pe how people and typically end up buying high, selling low, holding too much risk. So I was fascinated with all that. And so I, I'd been studying it both, you know, on the trading floor, read the Market Wizard books, which I thought were, you know, if you, you know, that's what I start out any trader with is read Jack Schwager's Market Wizard books, because those stories are about the psychology elements. In fact, um, when I, as I read all these different interviews with the Market Wizards in, you know, across uh, at least three books, there were many common themes, and I, and I highlighted about six of them. Psychology is obviously one of them. Uh, others were risk management, uh, uh, probability, probability is a huge one, discipline, consistency. Um, and these sort of became the pillars, the things that all these traders kept talking about, you know, and, um, a given market wizard may not highlight all six of them, but, but you found at least three or four of these common pillars being what a market wizard said was responsible for their success. Yeah. And there's a little bit of, uh, you know, some people succeed just on luck, but we'll, we'll leave that as it is. So, but by far the biggest thing for me was the, the probability based thinking. Um, and because I was a poor math student in high school and college, 
So that was an area of weakness for me. I just, I committed myself to teaching myself probability and statistics in my thirties, um, so that I could understand it. And, and it, and it couldn't have happened at a better time because then Nassim Taleb published the black swan in 2007 before the financial crisis blew up. You know, it wasn't until July of, um, 2007, that, Bear, that the Bear Stearns hedge funds uh, linked to CDOs and mortgage-backed securities blew up. Um, Taleb basically predicted that, although he he would say you can't predict a black swan. Um, he basically did because Wall Street was using basically using standard deviation to measure risk. And standard deviation is not a good measure for risk in financial markets because Financial markets exhibit what his mentor, Benoit Mandelbrot, called wild randomness. So as I'm doing this research, you know, um, basically I concluded we want to study the rogue traders, the guys, uh, you know, look at long, here's, uh, I, I highlight uh, long-term capital management, you know, Nobel Prize winners took down LTCM. Um, I got Nick Leeson in here talking about him at Barings. Um, you know, you study the rogues because as I say, what the rogue does to a billion dollars, we can do to our own accounts. Um, and that is my main lesson about studying the rogues. So when I published my 2008 article, uh, French trader Jerome Curbiel, oh, it was Sock Gen, yeah. He wiped, he wiped off uh, 5 billion euros for Sock Gen, um, covering, you know, he took on excessive risk and then he was covering up the bad trades and risk management didn't catch it. And, you know, I put this note in here. He says he did not work alone and that the culture of the bank was prone to excessive risk taking. And I say that's a good story for another time because, you know, it's um, the culture obviously can contribute to someone's uh, propensity to take extra risk and hide it, especially if there's losses. Uh, and it's all the same thing. This is the the reason that people uh, that Bernie Madoff made off with people's money is because they trusted him. They believed him. They didn't, you know, they didn't question anything. They just, they let the, uh, they let the rogue keep on going. So here's uh, here were a couple of my big conclusions. I had two important conclusions regarding rogue traders. First, we have a lot to learn from them because as you'll see, when we dive into the twin sciences of our irrationality, neuroscience and behavioral, um, behavioral economics, uh, which this article goes into in detail, what the rogue trader does to a billion dollars of OPM, we can do to our own accounts. And here was my second conclusion. I said, rogues would always keep happening, no matter how much regulation or oversight. That's what I said in 2008 when I published this article before we ever heard of Bernie Madoff. And then six months later, hello, here's your next rogue. Um, so another interesting twist on this story, as, as I mentioned, this magazine I published it in was called SFO. The magazine publisher for SFO was caught in his own Ponzi scheme. And, you know, that's why I had to recreate the article here on Medium. Um, Russell Wasendorf was the former chairman and chief executive officer of Peregrine Financial Group a commodity broker that filed for bankruptcy protection in July in Chicago in July 2012. According to Wikipedia, he was arrested following a suicide attempt. Why was he potentially committing suicide? Um, he, had, he had embezzled over $200 million from more than 13,000 customers over the course of 20 years. And this guy was you know, located in the Heartland in Iowa. So I'm sure it hurt a lot of local people there uh, who believed in him, that he was the, the big genius. But he was basically taking money out of, you know, segregated client accounts and using it for his own lifestyle. Uh, I don't know if, if he's still around, but he's definitely still doing time. So uh, I go on to talk about the twin sciences of our irrationality, um, and I call it the Big Bang of Intelligence. So please check out this, uh, my Medium article, uh, it's linked at the top of my Twitter page. So um, let's go there right now. So right at the top of 
of my Twitter page. You just click on uh, Medium. Um, actually, that'll take that'll take you to my my general Medium blog. But if you scroll down, the the pin tweet at the top is "Mental Models of Financial Sabotage." What can you learn from market rogues and wizards about your brain on risk? So if you click this Google link right there, that'll take you right to the article with lots of good details on neuroscience and uh, behavioral economics um, and, and how the, what we can learn from those sciences to help ourselves be more rational when we approach markets. Now, uh, I want to share something a little personal, but it also helps us look at markets. Um, the world lost somebody else great this week. Well, I, I don't want to say somebody else great because Bernie Madoff wasn't great. He was infamous for all the wrong reasons. But we lost somebody great this week in my life, and that would be my dad, who uh, passed away on Sunday at uh, the ripe old age of 87. Um, he was in declining health, so it wasn't wasn't a big surprise to our family, although it's always a shock. So, you know, we're all dealing with it. Um, and I just published a podcast and article about him because my dad was a pilot for United Airlines, taught me to fly small airplanes as a teenager, and I had written him a book for his 80th birthday, a little over five years ago. I'd written him this book called Flight Plan for Trading. And it was just a short book. Just I wanted to tell him how what he taught me about flying and aviation basically helped me have the right mindset to build a career as a trader and an investor in my 30s and 40s. And, um, you know, so I wanted to let him know that, that even though uh, my my older brothers went on to become uh, quite proficient pilots uh, in their own ways, I did not choose aviation for a career. But I so I but I wanted to let him know that what he taught me was was still powerful for me. And and I think it's powerful for anybody, even if you've never taken a flying lesson. Um, I want you to read this article. You know, the podcast is only uh, like 18 minutes long, and it, it goes right into some of the lessons that you can learn from pilots to apply to trading and investing. The article version is a little longer if you want to get to know my dad and all the cool stuff he did, because he, uh, I mean, he started out flying seaplanes in Minnesota. He was, uh, he taxied uh, Fran Tarkington, Viking quarterback legend around the state in the early 60s. Um and then he got a job with United Airlines in 1964, moved down to Illinois. And that's how he found me because uh, his family started babysitting me when I was a baby. And eventually they took us in. Um, so there's a lot of cool story there. Uh, his, my dad's name, uh, Eugene D. Olson. His nickname was uh, Ole, Ole Olson from the land of Vikings. Um, he also flew aerobatics. Let me show you uh, one of his planes. So here is, this is a pretty cool plane called a Hyperbipe. Um, it's uh, obviously a staggered bi-wing. And uh, what's cool about it, you can't really tell from this photograph, but the, but the sides of the fuselage are flat. And so what, what the effect it has is it sort of makes the entire fuselage an airfoil of its own. Um, 200 horsepower Lycoming engine and fully aerobatic. Um, and my brother Rory helped restore it. Um, my dad flew a Piper Cub and in the seventies, he won international aerobatic championships. My brother then flew this. They, they owned this since the late eighties and my brother won IAC international aerobatic club championships in the early two thousands, like 2002, 2003. Um, so pretty cool stuff there. Um, show you a picture of my dad here in his early seaplane days. You know, this is probably, this could be like 1960 or earlier or something. There he is on the left, uh, tall, cool guy. Um, yeah, it was a little seaplane, you know, Minnesota land of 10,000 lakes. You know, how to, how, how could a pilot get a job and get around? Obviously puddle jumping. So, uh, definitely uh, check out the article. You know, you can find it. You can find it on Zach's, but you can also find it real quickly on my Twitter feed. Um, oh, here's here's a cool shot. This is this is um, a place where my dad obviously you know chartered uh, seaplane rides. It was called Surfside. Um, 
this photograph's got to be pretty old. But uh, on my Twitter feed, you can find the uh, the article on Zax.com. Here it is right here. I call it Flight Plan for Trading, just like the book I wrote my dad. Market Lessons from My Pilot Dad. I said, uh, Ole had an amazing career on wings from aerobatics to 747s. Uh, oh, and, and the, you got to read the article because my dad had a heart attack. He was my first, my dad was my first flight instructor when I was 16. Then he had a mild heart attack. And so my training stopped. Now, in 1980, if uh, a commercial airline pilot had a heart attack, his career was basically over. Um, but my dad became a guinea pig of sorts for the new angioplasty procedure because it was a mild heart attack. They could see the blockage. He went to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota and in Florida. They used angioplasty, you know, catheter up through the leg, little balloon on the end, uh, uh, you know, expand the artery. And then he couldn't fly for about two years. But during that time, they're obviously, you know, monitoring his health. He had to do a lot of rigorous, you know, stress testing, treadmill, all this stuff. And they said his heart was as good as new. And he was allowed to go back to flying. He basically paved the way for all airline pilots to be able to recover from a heart disease incident and be able to fly again as long as they didn't have surgery. Um, so he was he was really the the maverick, the the progenitor there. And uh, and then I was able to get finish my flight training. I actually got my uh, got my private license in in the summer of my 18th year before he got his medical. But he got he got his medical like two months later. And then he took me up again as uh, as my instructor and checked me out in the next higher plane, the, the Cessna 172. So a lot of cool stories there about my dad, my family. Um, so check that out. You can find it here on my Twitter feed. And again, I th in the article, in the podcast and in the article, I detail what can we actually learn from pilots. There are a lot of lessons about the, the systems, the routines, the habits, the mental discipline of pilots, you know, revolving around planning and preparation that get them safely, them and their passengers safely from point A to point B, you know, millions and millions of times a year. And we can learn something from their approach to planning and preparation as traders and investors. So take it from my dad and, uh, uh, you know, and, and put some wings on your investing and trading. All right. Thanks for joining me in the kitchen. We'll talk to you next week.